Hello, family and friends. Well, guess what? It's that time again. It's time for the weekly dose of encouragement. But before I get go any further, I need to tell you this. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas from our family, the Banks Bunch, to you and to yours. We bless you during this holiday season. Well, did you know that the greatest encourager of all time lives and moves and exists inside of you? It's true. Acts chapter 17, verse 28 says this. It says, it is through him, Jesus, that we live and we function and we have our identity. And it's because we've been filled with and backed by the most exemplary, the most excellent encouragement that has ever existed. We're called to do what the word instructs us in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Listen to what it says. It says that we are to love one another by speaking encouraging words to one another. We're called to build up hope so that we will all be together in this with no one left out and no one left behind. I don't know about you, but I hate feeling left out. I don't like to feel left behind. And so today, using the word of God as our roadmap with an end goal of encouraging you and building you up, I'm going to be working through some stories. And I invite you to partner your faith with mine and come on a journey with me. Are you ready? Let's get started. There's a quote that I've heard Bill Johnson say. He says this, any area of your life that you have no hope in is under the influence of a lie. So what do you think? Do, do you believe what Bill Johnson says is true? The Shawshank Redemption is a prison movie set in the 1940s. About, it's about two incarcerated men, Red and Andy. They bond over a number of years and they find comfort and redemption through acts of common decency. Red is a prison veteran who was convicted of murder. Andy once was a young, successful vice president of a major bank but his life took a serious detour after his wife and her lover are murdered and the crime gets pinned on him. There's a scene in the movie where Andy begins talking to Red about dreams and about hopes, and Red tries to set Andy straight. He warns him, don't you dare think this way. Red says this to Andy. He says, hope is a dangerous thing. Hope can drive a man insane. Red's advice comes from his personal experiences and from his disappointments. He's basically telling Andy this. He says, like, don't hope. Whatever you do, don't hope because hope will only crush you. The movie demonstrates how Red's statement is both true and it's also false. You see, one man named Brooks, he's paroled after 50 years of incarceration. Brooks returns to the outside world void of hope. And without anything to live for, Brooks committed suicide. But Andy's hope, Andy's hope changed the way that he lived and it dictated his pattern of life and eventually his hope was fulfilled. So I'll ask you again, is red right? Is, is hope just a false expectation that will only lead to disappointment? If that's the case, then we don't have any reason to hope at all. There is absolutely, if Red is right, there is no basis for hope. The title of my message today is Hope to the World. Hope is frequently associated with the Christmas holidays. You see the word hope on Christmas cards and Christmas ornaments. You hear it in Christmas songs and Christmas carols. People want a reason to have hope especially this time of year. People need a reason to hope and they are desperately looking for one. And yet, if you look around, many times during the Christmas season, it, it seems to amplify people's hopelessness. The Christmas season often seems to put a magnifying glass on people's loneliness, their fear, their shame, their depression, their feelings of unworthiness. Our sins of loss, our sense of regret, our sense of what might have been or what could have been or what should have been, come on, the could have, would have, and should have, they seem to flood to the surface of our hearts during this holiday season. The society we live in, uh, live in oftentimes leads us to be disgruntled, annoyed, embarrassed, or frustrated because we want an instant fix. We want instant gratification. Simply stated, we want a better life now and we're not willing to wait for it. 
We want the unresolved wounds of our hearts and our souls to just magically disappear without any work or effort. One of the ways that we try to fill the holes, the gaping wounds in our hearts, is through consumerism. Thanksgiving, which was originally set aside to what? Give thanks, I know you know the answer to that one, has turned into the biggest shopping day of the year. It started out as Black Friday, which turned into Cyber Monday, and let's just be honest, we're now at like Cyber Month, and is it Cyber Months? I don't even know, it starts so early. These things feed the black hole of inadequacy and despair that we feel that our lives have fallen into. We've completely lost the ability most of us, not all of us, but many of us have completely lost the ability to take the time to slow down and to give thanks. We've turned the focus off of others, off of Jesus, and on to us. Me, me, me. I, I, I. I want it. I have to have it. The sale is now. I'm going to drop everything, even my family, even the people that I've said yes to, and I'm going to focus all my efforts and all my energy on filling my desire now. But listen, Christmas truly is a time of hope if we keep our focus on the one who is hope, the one who is peace, the one who is joy. But to get to that place, we first must identify and define hope according to the author, the perfecter, the sustainer, and the finisher of our hope. Hope must be defined according to the one who is hope, and his name is Jesus. Let's begin by first comparing worldly hope with biblical hope. Worldly hope is related to the circumstances and the situations, the current things that are going on in your life. It's an empty wish, a wishful thinking, a desire. It's the feeling that what you want can be had or that life's events will turn out for the best. Worldly hope says this. It says, if I were to have hope, it would only be because things played out okay for me. Relaying, it, it relies solely, worldly hope relies solely on the, uh, the conditions. Worldly hope says this. It says, if it doesn't work out, listen, I'm giving up. This doesn't work out, that's it. Throw it in the towel. <laughs> when hope is attached to the circumstances and the situations that you're in in your current world, it can be fragile and it can be fickle. Some examples of worldly hope include the following. These are not limited, but listen to some of these. I hope I will receive every item that I put on my Christmas shopping list, or my Christmas wish list, I should say. I hope that all my Amazon packages not only arrive on time, but that nothing gets broken or damaged or that they get it all right. I hope I make it through the winter season without getting ill. There's people out there right now, they're saying, I hope I make it through the winter season without getting the coronavirus. We're not worried about any of that. I hope that my ex and I get to reconcile. You get the picture. There, the worldly hope is focused on what's happening right now. Biblical hope, on the other hand, can be defined as the confident and joyful expectation of something good. Let me say that again. Biblical hope, simply defined, is the confident and joyful expectation of something good. It's not just a wishing or a longing, but a positive, optimistic anticipation that is saturated with assurance and conviction that what lies ahead will indeed be good. What lies ahead is guaranteed to be good. An example of biblical hope is our certitude that winter will turn into spring. There's a quote that says, no winter lasts forever, no spring skips its turn. In our culture, there's a push after Christmas to get through winter. January and February, they're usually the coldest months of the year. It's often dreary and the sun doesn't come out much. But even in the bleak, dull, damp of the winter season, deep within us, deep within you, within you, you know that winter cannot last forever. Eventually, spring will come. Before you know it, in due time, the weather will begin warming back up. The days will gradually begin to get longer and longer. The gray hue of the sky will yield to crystal blue. Rays of sunshine will extend into the abyss of forever. 
The ribbons of cottony clouds expressing their delight, their wonder, and their anticipation of the coming growth. They woo us into pleasure, into possibility, and into playfulness. Buds and leaves will begin forming on the trees, and you know that spring is right around the corner. This example, this is a perfect example of biblical hope. You are confident and you are sure that while winter may be long, the season will not last forever and the future ahead holds change and beauty. Hope can be compared, can be compared to an immovable anchor that holds us steady and firm. Hebrews 6, 18 through 19 says this. It says, therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor of our souls. Now listen to this. First of all, did you catch that therefore we who have fled to Jesus, right? When those that have fled to him, we can have not a little bit, like maybe this might happen, but it says in the Bible that we can have great assurance, great assurance that as we hold onto the hope that lies before us, one of the things that you need to catch right here is it doesn't say that you hold onto the hope that was in your past, nor does it say that you're going to hold onto the hope that lies in your present. No, the Bible says that you can have great confidence that as you hold onto the hope that lies before you. Hope is ahead of you. Can you see it? I can. In Matthew chapter 12 verses 18 and 21, we see that the idea of Christmas and, ho and hope are linked. Listen to what it says. It says, look at my servant whom I have chosen. He is my beloved who pleases me. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. And here it is and his name will be the hope of all the world. His name, Jesus' name, will be the hope of all the world. The Passion Translation says it a little bit differently, and I want to share it with you. It says, and the fame of Jesus' name will birth hope among the people. Jesus' name, just his name, not even his acts, not his miracles or anything else, just the name of Jesus, the fame of his name will birth hope among the people. Have you ever been in a dire and desperate situation? Have you ever been in a place where you feel like everything is against you, that nothing is making forward progress, that you take one step forward and it's 20 steps back? Have you ever been felt like you were trapped, maybe felt like you were drowning and unable to breathe? I would We'd encourage you speak the name of Jesus speak it out because guess what the Bible tells you tells us that the fame of his name just saying his name will birth hope into your life into your heart into your circumstances it'll shift the atmosphere lickety split the fame of his name births hope Jesus is the hope of all the world and Jesus will birth hope among the people the Bible, as you've heard me say umpteen times, the Bible's 100% true 100% of the time. In Numbers 23, 19, the Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie. And in Hebrews 6, 18, it says that it is absolutely impossible for God to lie. So if God doesn't tell a lie, and that means that the Bible is 100% true, then this, if the Bible says that Jesus is the hope of the world and that Jesus will birth hope among the people, this is true. Jesus will do it. We can count on it. We can take that promise to the bank. Signed, sealed, delivered, done. Jesus is hope, period. So I'm going to go through a little quick activation. Do you like to be activated? I know some of you probably are watching at work and maybe you can't do this right now, but you can kind of do it under your breath or you can do it in your mind. You can just think about it. But it's really important that you become, that you not just believe things, but you believe things by speaking them out, right? Your faith works. It, faith does. So repeat this after me. Say, Jesus is hope. Yeah. There you go. Now, let's make it personal. Say, Jesus is my hope. I bet you're doing it. I believe that you are. Say, Jesus has birthed hope in me. Awesome. Say, Jesus is birthing hope in me. 
Good job. Here we go. And Jesus will always birth hope in me. Yeah. You're doing great. I know you're talking to back to a screen. It's okay. This is the world we live in right now. I'm talking to a screen, believing that you are talking right back to me. Just say one more thing with me. Say, Jesus, I thank you that you are my hope. Great job, y'all. All right. So one of the things that you can do to take this further is not just declare that Jesus is your hope, that he has been your hope, he currently is your hope, and he'll always be your hope, but then you can apply that over every life situation and circumstance. Let's say you're about to lose your job. You go, well, Jesus, the Bible says that you are hope. So in this circumstance, in this situation where I'm about to lose my job, where I've just been diagnosed with cancer, where my mama just died, where my family just fell apart, where my husband just cheated on me, where my kid just lost his ever living mind again. Listen, Jesus, you are my hope in that situation. Can you do that? Write it down. Put it on a piece of paper. Put it on your mirror. I put things like, you should see my mirror. It's pretty interesting. We put all kinds of things because you need to remind yourself. You need to remind yourself. Jesus, whenever he was tempted, when he was tried by the devil, what he did is he reminded himself, he reminded the enemy, and he told all the atmosphere around him who he is, who his daddy is, and all the like. Quote scripture. All right, so let's move forward. The greatest reason for our hope is God himself. True hope is not grounded in circumstances, nor is it grounded in situations. True hope is not grounded in your spouse, in your job, in your kids, in your money. It's not grounded in any of those things, but in the person of Jesus. Because God's character and his nature are unchanging, he is trustworthy of your hope. God is faithful. He will always, always, always do what he promises. It's important that you understand that God doesn't promise you to give you everything that you wish for. He doesn't necessarily promise you an easy life or perfect health or material wealth. But what God does promise he could be trusted to fulfill. Let me share with you a few of the promises that God has made over your life. God promises you this. He promises that he will fight for you. God promises that he will give you strength and he will renew your strength. He promises you that there's no weapon, not one single weapon that is ever formed against you that shall prosper never once. He promises that when, not if, but when you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. So if you feel like you're drowning, you need to quote this thing. Jesus, you said, you said that when I go through rivers of difficulty, I'm not going to drown. I feel like I'm drowning. I feel like I cannot breathe, but you said this and just take a deep breath and breathe him in. God promises you this. He says that when, not if, you go through fires, I walk through fires of oppression, you will not be burned up and they will not consume you. Do you ever feel like it's hot around you? I bet you do. I know sometimes I do. And I just have to remind myself, God, you said that this thing is not going to destroy me. It doesn't matter how hot it gets around me. I'm going to make it through. God says, when you go through rivers of difficulty, you won't drown. When you go through deep waters, he will be with you. Do you ever feel like you're going, you know what it feels like when you're walking through deep water? It gets a little bit difficult. You're kind of floating and bobbing around and sometimes it's hard to keep your footing. But listen, when you go through those deep waters, you need to know God promises that he will be with you. God promises to give you wisdom if you ask for it. He promises that he will always be with you. He will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. God promises that he will care for you and that he will provide for you. God promises to give you strength to overcome temptations and trials in life. Hebrews 10, 23 affirms that God is trustworthy to do what he says he'll do. Listen to this. It says, so now we must cling tightly to the hope that lives within us, knowing, knowing, knowing that God always keeps his promises. Now, I want to point something out to you. It says here, now you, we must cling tightly. It doesn't say that you just kind of put your finger on it or, you know, like hold on with your pinky or something like that. God says, no, he says, you must cling tightly. 
If you've got somebody close to you, we, me and my family did this the other day, I want you to grab a hold of them, pull them close, cling tightly. When you cling tightly to someone, listen, you're close. You might be able to smell their breath, good or bad. You can feel their heartbeat. You can feel the temperature of your body. Cling tightly to hope. Don't just halfway grab a hold. Cling tightly. There's a big difference. We need to grab a hold of this. That God says, cling tightly to the hope that lives within us. And he doesn't say, cling tightly to somebody else's hope. He says, cling tightly to the hope that lives within me. You have hope living inside of you. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, the hope of glory, lives inside of you. So you've got the ability to, ability to cling tight. Maybe you just need to cling to yourself. Can everyone just do this real quick? Just squeeze yourself as hard as you can. Cling tightly. A great example of clinging tightly is the story of Christmas. Long before Jesus was born, the ancient prophets foretold many things, including that Jesus was coming, that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, would be born. The, they prophesied the location of his birth, uh, that it would be Bethlehem, that he would come from the seed of Abraham. They prophesied that he would come from the tribe of Judah, from the family line of Jesse, and from the house of David. They prophesied that Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, would come before him and would prepare the way. They prophesied that he would be born of a virgin and that they would be calling him Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And you got to know this. Every single thing that was foretold was fulfilled because God always makes good on his promises. The story of Jesus' birth is told in both Matthew and in Luke. I'm going to be combining the two stories, and I'm going to read it all. It's a little bit of a lengthy read, but listen, I'll never apologize for reading the Bible to you. The Bible is, is it can become your best friend. I love, love, love my Bible. My Bible and I, we have lots of good conversations. I make lots of notes. We have a good time because my Bible is the Word. It says that Jesus is the Word of God, so you can be friends with your Bible. I encourage you, as I'm reading through this story, to let Holy Spirit bring to your recollection the times where God prophesied through his word, just like they foretold about Jesus, that God prophesied through his word or through another person or possibly through music. And as I'm reading, I encourage you to allow yourself to remember the promises that God has already fulfilled in your life. Allow yourself to put your hope in him and imagine the places where Jesus will be faithful for you. Are you ready? Here we go. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby will be born holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. And Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country in Judea to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted, greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you among all women and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby within my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. Then Mary responded in a beautiful song of praise to God. It's called the Magnificat, and I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. Here's the song that Mary sang. Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. He made this promise to all our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. It's a beautiful song of praise. It then says that Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then went back to her hometown. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the, God, the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until their son was born. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. All returned to their ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. And Joseph named him Jesus. That night, the shepherds were staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. He said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to the people. The Savior Yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and she thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and all they had seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Through the prophets, God promised that Jesus' name would be Emmanuel, which means God with 
us. Now let, let me just pause right there and say this. Every time I say Jesus, Emmanuel, what I would love for you to do is complete the sentence. God with us. Let's try it one time. Jesus, Emmanuel. Ready? God with us. 700 years before Jesus was born, God prophesied that his son, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, would always and forever be with you. God promised Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. He didn't promise Jesus, Emmanuel, a God who will sometimes be with you or a God who is annoyed with you, a God who will move in next door but only visit you periodically. No, he did not promise a God who is only with you when you've been good, nor did he promise a God who enters and leaves on a whim when he gets bored with you. He didn't promise Jesus, Emmanuel, a God who is negligent, who ignores you, who's impatient and patient or impassive. No, God said, and his name will be Jesus, Emmanuel. Here we go. God with us. God made you a promise when he named his son Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And God is in the business of keeping his promises. The great hope of the Christmas season is found in a person named Jesus. The great hope of the Christmas season is found in the name Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. I want you to say his name with me again. Are you ready? Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. You need to know that every breath you take, that Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, is with you. Every step that you take, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, is with you. Every breath you make, every move you take, everywhere you go, you cannot escape the wonderful, all-encompassing, amazing Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. When you have a great success, when you get a promotion, when you graduate from high school or college or whatever, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, he's with you. When life is going great, when you've got no problems, no cares in the world, guess what? Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, he's with you. But listen to this. When sadness seems to overtake you, when life gets tough, when it seems that none are for you and all are against you, when it feels as if you're being swallowed up by the cares of this life and you're getting hit at every turn and all hope seems lost, you need to know this. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, is with you. The king of the universe is on his throne. He always has been and he always will be. So when it appears that he is not, it is not his position, but your perception that is changed. When you feel that Christ has abandoned you, when you feel that there is no hope inside of you, it is not that God has changed. It is that your perception of him has changed. Colossians 1.27 says this. It says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Can you say that? Can you say Christ in me, the hope of glory? This is not just for some people. If you are a Christian, if you have accepted Christ, then Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus Christ, the king of the universe, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the, the lamb of God, he is is the one who is hope and he is inside of you. So let's do a real quick demonstration. Don't you love activations? We've done several, several already today, but here's another one. I'm gonna ex uh, show you and demonstrate how when it feels like God has left you, that it's just your perception, not him that's changed. Are you ready? Here we go. I want you to take your pointer finger, whichever one's your favorite, Mine's my right, I'm right-handed. And I want you to put it directly in front of you. Now I want you to stare at that finger. Don't look around it, don't look over it. Stare directly at that finger. Now let me ask you a question while you're staring at that finger. How many fingers do you have holding up? Three, 20? No, you've got one. We can all agree there's just one finger. So take that finger, stare at that finger, okay? And as you slowly move that finger towards your face, 
I want you to not look past it, not look around it, but stare at that finger. Now, if you've done it right, something should change. You should go from looking like and seeing that there's one finger to possibly two or three. Now, the thing about it is, is we all agreed, you just have one finger up, right? But your perception of that finger has changed. It's the same way with God. God is on the throne. Jesus Emmanuel, God with us, is always and forever with you. He never, ever leaves you. Jesus Emmanuel, God with us, he stays close to you. He is within you. He moves with you. He walks with you. He is closer than a brother, and he is always with you. So I'd like to ask you a question. What would you change? How would your life be different? How would you live your life differently if your perception that light lined up with the fact that Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us is always with you. He's with you when you get have more bills at the end of the month than you have paycheck. He's with you when you get a phone call from your doctor that says you have terminal illness. He's with you when your friend lets you down or even worse, betrays you. He's with you when your spouse tells you they no longer love you. He's with you when your days are filled with fails and mishaps and blunders. He's with you when nothing goes right and everything goes wrong. Jesus Emmanuel, God with us, is with you. He never changes. He never shifts. He's the author, the source, and the wellspring of hope. So whatever situation, whatever circumstance, whatever season you find yourself in, you need to know. You need to get it deep down within you. Just say it over yourself over and over and over. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us means that God with you. God with me. As I close I want to remind you that although the world system would try to convince you that you don't have time or that there's never a good time for you to spend time with Jesus, I'd like to propose something to you. Listen, time is short. And I would say to you that you actually don't have time to not spend time with, with Jesus. I'll just give you a little tip, a little trick about, about my personal life. I'm busy. I've got a lot going on. I'm not just developing and releasing these sermons, but I am a full-time homeschool mama. I volunteer at our church. Um, I help take care of family that lives close by. I've got a lot on my plate. But the thing that I've come to find is that it, just like with tithing, if I give Jesus the first part of my day, even if, even if all I have, five, 10, 15 minutes to sit down and read my Bible and be quiet with him. If I give him my first before I check my watch or check my phone or get on Facebook or do any of these other things, interact, even interact with my husband. Listen, I love my husband. He is my best friend. I love him. I love him. I love him. I love him. But he does not get the first part of my day. If I give Jesus all my affections and all my attention and all my devotion before I give it to anything else or anyone else. Let me tell you, I don't even know how it happens, but it seems like my time gets multiplied. That's the way that things work in the kingdom. So if you say, I don't have time, I don't have time to read my Bible, I don't have time to pray, what are you doing? Because I guarantee you're putting your time somewhere. By the way, this is not a rebuke. This is an encouragement. You've got time, and I want to encourage you to spend that time. Jesus paid a high price so that you and I could walk in abundance. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, is the hope of glory, and he is always with you. Jesus, Emmanuel, is the hope of the world. And if you allow him, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, will birth hope in you. Well, this has been a fun time today. I'm not really sure what happened with the videoing. We'll see if this is all going to show up or not. <laughs> if the first part of the video doesn't show up, then maybe I'll need to re-record it. But someone could let me know too. That would be helpful. In the meantime, 
I just want to bless you with a very Merry Christmas from the Banks, Banks Bunch. Kelly, myself, Brendan Corbin, and Carolyn, we bless you in the name of Jesus to be everything that you were created to be. Nothing more, nothing less perfectly perfect in every way. We bless you to know who you are and whose you are. We bless you to have great um, inputs of your identity, your value, and your worth, which, by the way, is, doesn't come from the things that you do. It's because of who you are. I bless you to have outrageous encounters and experiences with the King of Glory, and, and especially this holiday season. I bless you to filling with overflowing amounts of hope upon hope upon hope, which again, isn't in your past and it's not in your present. It's in your future. His name is Jesus. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. We'll see you soon. Bye.